many, many thanks for the invitation. And I'm, I'm really sorry that I didn't manage to go in person. So um, this is a long title, as you, you can see, where I'll try to make you an update of a theme we've been working in Ulm in the last um, few years already. And that concerns the persistence of cohere or the possible persistence, if you want in a conservative manner, of coherent effects in, in a very noisy environment. Hmm? So we're gonna be um, dealing with a type of systems that perhaps are not uh, our natural habitat normally. Yeah, I come from a quantum optics background and these are uh, complexes of different types that are hosted in membrane proteins of different organisms. The common denominator they have is that they are involved in different processes of interest in biology following irradiation and then an ultra fast process that is gonna be performed with a very high quantum yield. Mm -hmm. So, we can be talking about photosynthesis in, in plants, algae or, or bacteria, eh? the, the primary steps of photosynthesis may also refer to um, radical pair formation, that is a type of spin reaction that is suspected to, to be relevant for belt navigation, or another candidate is the process of, of uh, retinal isomerization, the initial steps of vision. Mm -hmm. So the point is that, first of all, I will sub-select the type of pigment protein complexes that have been more investigated experimentally. So I will, I will be referring to photosynthesis and then, at the end, we'll tell you how much we, we can extrapolate. Mm. So the reason we started being interested in this type of complexes, having a background in investigating which conditions are generally necessary in order to have coherent and entanglement persisting on long and longer time scales, is that there was a sequence of experiments that I will tell you the, the gist of it, that show that actually on time scales that are already relevant in biology, I'm talking about a few picosecond time scale, there seems to be a persistent coherence, name long leaf coherence in a way that um, we have to understand what does exactly meaning. And then the core of the talk is um, to deploy methods we've been developed in um, open system theory in order to understand whether indeed we can benchmark as quantitatively as possible that indeed some coherent uh, dynamics is present on those, those time scales. Right. So this is a little bit the, the James Cummings model of quantum biology. This is a, a complex involved in the photosynthesis of green sulfur bacteria. And let's say for biochemistry standards, relatively simple. Okay? So it was in fact the first one to be um, crystallized and fully assessed in X-ray spectroscopy. But it exhibits already the, the ingredients that will be essential for our discussion. And that is having a network of pigments that you can really think of them as two level systems, where the only thing that we are interested on is whether they are in the ground state of half experience and electronic excitation. And then we have a coherent coupling term in between pigments that allow excitations to migrate across of this network, which is hosted in a phonon bath. Okay? A phonon bath that is provided in this scenario, both by intramolecular modes 
and also slow emotions that come from the protein background that holds the thing together. Hmm? Right, so we have in this complex in, in, in particular, an enormous body of experimental information. Experimental information that comes from different forms of spectroscopy, linear spectroscopy, starting from absorption spectrum to linear circular dichroism, and then supplemented by nonlinear spectroscopy that, let's say, allows us to start putting numbers in the type of theoretical description we will want to accomplish. So what are the energies of the different sites? What sort of coupling do I expect to have in between different chromophores? So one idea that is relevant is that the way we start building up Hamiltonians, right, and possible ways of describing the coupling to the surrounding phonomic modes come from a combination of first principle calculations and also reduce models that try to provide a com a, a, as complete as possible fitting to the different forms of spectroscopy. Okay, so it's a little bit like um, the models astrophysicists do really a lot of parameters that need to be fitted in the light of more and more complete experimental information. And what is very relevant to keep in mind, eh, because it's going to be very important later on, is that these fittings right, that set the ground for me to use this type of numbers in my theoretical description, come from performing different um, adjustments to the spectral densities that characterize the fluctuation of the, of the phonons, right? As you will see, this is a very complex function, the one that's measured or calculated by molecular dynamics, and typically, they do require some forms of embeddings. So besides linear spectroscopy, the transfer of the multidimensional techniques that were developed in NMR to the visible, then allow to complete the picture by means of performing two-dimensional electronic spectroscopy. And I think, well, arguably, this, um, these two experiments performed in the group of Graham Fleming probably were the ones that really captured the attention of communities beyond photosynthesis. Hmm? So let's say that the conclusion that was um, put forward following these experiments is that there were signals, signatures in the spectral response showing oscillatory behavior in the picosecond time scale. So let's try to understand what sort of experiments we are talking about and why people were argued that they showed quotation marks long lived coherence. Hmm? So these are experiments where one uses a sequence of um, laser pulses, right, with controllable time separations in such a way that coherence can be created and probed at a later time. Yeah? So it's a complicated technique that will require some time to discuss, but I think you can understand um, what is underpinning it, if you think a much, of a much simpler situation where we perform Ramsey spectroscopy. Yeah? So think about a situation where I have a common ground state yeah? and a simple system where I only have two sides coupled to each other, yielding to a lower energy exciton yeah? and a higher energy exciton in such a way that the excitonic split it is this capital omega one two. So by illuminating 
with the right pi over two pulse, I can prepare a coherent superposition of the two excitonic states. Eh? This will precess in this interferometric setup in between pulses in such a way that if I, I apply the second pi over two pulse and I check, let's say, for the population of the upper exciton, typically, if this evolution is fully coherent, if there is no noise in between the two pulses, it would be a typical sinusoidal signal. Eh? If in reality you do the experiment as a result of the different noise sources that you will have, then you will have a damped exponential. Right, the denomination long leaf coherent concerns the behavior of what would be a superposition ground first exciton versus the oscillatory behavior of a excitonic superposition. Mm? So this is a femtosecond time scale. There is a very strong local defacing versus observations that indicate that the lifetime of excitonic superpositions exceeds by large uh, the corresponding to a superposition ground excited. Eh? So that's the origin of saying long. It's long as compared to this ground excited. Okay, so now you can take a very pragmatic viewpoint saying what is going on? Why is it possible that even at room temperature I am able to have coherent remnants on a picosecond time scale, right? Within an open system approach. And then beyond, it will come the far reaching question of saying, okay, if there is coherent pressing on a time scale where things of relevant happen in biology, is this coherence actually instrumental for something? Is it facilitating, assisting, or making certain processes more efficient? Take into account that you would like to go beyond qualitative eh, and proving in the same way that teleportation is assisted by entanglement. You would have to find eh, a proof, a quantitative argument showing that certain processes happen more efficient if coherence is present than, this is, than when it's absent. Eh? While I would say that the second part is open to discussion, eh? I think we have a nice understanding of why, what sort of mechanisms are at play that could indeed facilitate that on those time scales we have a form of coherence that is not going to be purely excitonic as it was initially thought, but actually more, more involved than that. What is interesting is that um, a characteristic behavior of these molecular complexes can be achieved already if you do even a back of the envelope calculation where you describe the effect of the phonon bath in terms of just Limbladian dissipators. Okay? If you would do that, you would already unveil that this type of complexes like to be sitting in the fence in such a way that neither the dynamics is dominated by the coherent part of the evolution, neither is fully dissipative eh? in such a way that if our figure of merit, for instance, is the amount of excitonic energy that is conveyed to a certain part of the network as a function of the defacing rate, then we encounter this typical non-monotonic behavior when there is an optimal value of the noise where actually the task of transferring is completed more efficiently. Mm -hmm. This can be nicely seen in experiments. This is a, a transport experiment performed with an array of um, 10 qubits eh, in, the, in, in the ion trap group of Blatt and, and Ross. And um, of course, given the, let's say, the required conditions, this, this phenomena would manifest. But the issue is whether 
this is actually what is happening in this type of complexes. Hmm? Because if we look at the spectrum of the fluctuations, if we look at the typical forms of spectral densities that will be characterized in our environment, we find functions, as you can see, that have all the typical features for traditional master equations of Lindblad form not being applicable. Mm -hmm. So in principle, we could try to look for reduced models, right, where you embed certain environmental features within the definition of your system and treat the rest as a Markovian background. But in the presence of such a structured environment, this is a protocol where you can get into trouble very quickly. So in order not to be ransom of the approximations one makes in order to derive different forms of, Marco of Markovian or non-Markovian master equations, it would be good to actually see how far we can go with numerically exact techniques. And this is precisely what we did already, gosh, almost more than 10 years, or 10 years ago, right? And that concerns the using of exact numerics to be able to analyze the behavior of a model system that is just dimeric. Eh? Actually, the numbers used were inspired by the lowest energy excitons of the initial complex I showed you, uh, the fena matthew olson complex. But we consider the effect of the environment exactly as far as vibrations that were almost resonant with excitonic transitions are concerned. Hmm? If you write down what would be the total Hamiltonian of the system environment complex, and you rewrite it, okay? taking local defacing, let's say, as ad hoc information that comes from molecular dynamics calculations, okay? since that the main source of defacing is local modes. And we rewrite the total Hamiltonian in the excitonic basis that results from making diagonal the coupling, the dipolar coupling between pigments, then let's say a, a qualitative picture starts to emerge where we can see that the effect of localized modes can actually be an inbuilt driving force that could potentially be able to restore the coherence that is lost as a result of all the other broadband modes that are far of resonant. So to do that in the case of a, of a dimeric system is now it is possible, right, to employ TDMRG techniques well known in, in, in condensed matter that allow us to transform a typical configuration, right, given the spectral density, once the spectral density is provided, into a geometry that is amenable to do TMRG, given that it only involves coupling between nearest neighbors. Mm? So then we can provide what would be exact calculations for being in the presence of a background that contains quasi-resonant modes. And then being able to see, eh, taking into account that in this case, I can propagate the whole universe, then trace out the modes, and in fact, access what would be the dynamical properties of the excitonic state, right? And what I encounter is that the values of the excitonic coherences can indeed be sustained by these quasi resonant modes. More relevant, this will even be present when I operate at room temperature. So the presence of this structured background can actually be good news as far as the persistence of coherence is concerned. As I said before, qualitatively, we can understand it in terms of saying 
This is very much like being defacing while driving, right? So then these quasi-resonant modes are able to pump back, right, the defacing effect due to all the other background. Fine, that would be nice, but if we look at the actual form of the spectral densities for whole complexes, then we encounter that this uh, calculation may still be simplistic, right? In the sense that depending on the type of complex, right? If I represent what is the value of the excitonic splitting calculated in terms of the coherent um, dipolar coupling, then I encounter that A, I can have many modes in the vicinity of that resonance, and B, I may have very long tails um, in the high energy region. So what is the effect of those? Can I really smooth them out? Can I perform embeddings that is, as I mentioned at the very beginning, the technique that has been used to do the fittings to the linear spectroscopy? And well, this is actually, this is the more recent uh, results I'm presenting you and just this week, we got them accepted for publication. So, the thing is that we have to be very careful eh? because if we look at the different uh, parameters that characterize the couplings to the different local, localized modes, we encounter A, a large variation, and B, there may be cases where the couplings are very weak, but we have many modes. So then indeed, the effect of considering the full spectral density can actually be highly non-trivial. I don't know how I'm doing with the time. You essentially have three minutes. Okay, perfect. So then I will focus, there is here a lot of information. I'm gonna focus only in showing you what are the results of doing exact calculation eh, of absorption spectra carrying all the 55 modes that characterize another model complex eh, and show you how does the spectrum changes. So this is figure C here in the middle. Mm? And then you can see with the green dots that would correspond to the measured spectrum. And in the other colored lines, I have a representation of the exact calculation. Okay? When I perform embeddings in such a way that I only consider 20 modes in red, you see that is pretty far from the actually measured spectra. When I include 40, right, still not okay. And you see in black what happens when I consider the full distribution of these 55 modes I have present in the spectral density. So in this type of environments, it's risky to perform the typical tricks we do to try to encompass in a reduced model the effect of the vibrations. And what is relevant is that in fact, actually, I can do an estimation just using perturbation theory to see that I may have very significant lump shifts in some situations. But what is very relevant is that if I go back to trying to analyze two-dimensional spectroscopy where I can access the lifetimes of the different coherences that can be present, then as a result of the strong renormalization I may have in the presence of the complete spectral density, then the allocation of who is responsible for whom changes. Mm -hmm. So despite there has been a lot of controversy eh, arguing what sort of coherence is the one that we are observing, is it just ground? mode coherence in the ground state? 
is it a purely excitonic coherence in the excited state manifold? We strongly argue that in fact, we are witnessing vibronic coherence that has contribution both from electronic and vibrational degrees of freedom. And in fact, one of the more, more striking effects of considering the full spectrum of the fluctuations is that the electronic coupling can be strongly renormalized. So actually the strength of the electronic interaction may be larger than initially thought. So take home message is very tricky when we are dealing with noisy, noisy situations with a complex environmental fluctuations. It's very tricky to link a spectral response to the actual dynamics, taking into account that here we are not amenable to perform full tomography. Eh? So accessing, for instance, the excitonic state is not possible. Eh? We do partial tomography, if you, if you want, via these different spectral forms. But then connecting dynamics and the spectral response is far from trivial. Eh? So this is the reason that underpins the, the, the unambiguous interpretation of the, of the experimental results. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, the picture that in this type of complexes, we have a nice interplay in between the coherent and the incoherent part of the dynamics seems to be taking more and more ground. The thing is that if we believe that indeed this type of analysis show that we would have coherence in a significant lifetime, then what would be the next to trying to bridge the gap to see whether this has any importance in actual biology or even even if it doesn't at all, right? What would be the lessons that can be learned in order to have biomimetic or, or, or supra bio devices that perform with artificial structures, energy and charge transfer? Obviously, I think on the basis of the results showing strong renormalization effects, we need a next generation of experiments. And furthermore, developing more efficient exact techniques that would allow us to compute exactly the spectral multidimensional response beyond IMAS. And maybe from the purely theoretical point of view, maybe if you had a look at the, at the post of Giovanni Spaventa, this is a, um, an approach that we've followed recently with the aim of having uh, quantitative tools that may not tell us exactly what the truth is, what actual dynamics is, but allows us to discriminate the ones that definitely are not able to reproduce the experimental results. So with this, I conclude. Um, this has been a long story in a very small time. So this is the many people that have contributed and in red, the, still the current team. Thanks a lot for your attention. Oh. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for, for the talk. Are there questions here in the audience physically present? Stop the share. I don't see. Okay. Mm, let me check online. See if there is now. So let, let me ask you a strange question. <laughs> How, f I mean, how far are we from quantum biology? Depends on the <laughs> depends on the weight you want to to give to the to the term, right? I would say that for um, arguing that we have coherent effects in 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 a picosecond time scale, I think this is certainly the case, right? Now, if the question is how instrumental that can be for actual processes in biology, I think this is not known, okay. right? The thing is that even 
even, let's say, if the conclusion is that uh, at room temperature and in natural conditions, right, is actually totally irrelevant. Eh? So it may be that these complexes actually are able to sustain coherence eh, under the right conditions. So for instance, when they are manipulated with laser light, I think the, the far reaching result could be, how can we exploit then these phenomena in devices that are actually freed from the constraints you may have biologically. Eh? Mm -hmm. So exploiting these in technologies, photovoltaics, for instance, or any type of devices you can think whose task is to convey energy or perform charge separation. Mm -hmm. Okay. But nevertheless, I wouldn't give up yet on the issue of finding something that may in fact be relevant for biology. Maybe not in photosynthesis, and eh? that simply, I think is the, the more studied situation for historical reasons, right? But there may be other, other processes, eh? an isomerization retinal is one where actually hopefully we do have a, a, a nice quantitative relation. Okay, okay, so thank you very much. We have uh, also some other questions. Okay, one, I, I pick one because we are running a bit late. Uh, so there is a question. You mentioned the control over the phasing in optical simulators. Can we also think about implementation in quantum gas microscopes and maybe control dissipative dynamics in interactive? Ah, no, sorry, this was, so no, sorry, sorry, this was the wrong this one. not for me. No, no. <laughs> right. Yeah. Ah, no. Okay, no, sorry. So, uh, sorry. <laughs> when you use a reduced number of modes, to calculate uh, the spectra, how do you choose them? One could imagine that some modes are more relevant than others and that they contribute differently to the spectra. Okay, take into account that these 55 modes for WSCB is actually an exact form of the spectral density. Eh? So this funny complex has these 55. So the, the form of the spectral density is exact, right? So now the issue is that indeed, let's say if you want to do an open system analysis, typically what you do at the beginning is trying to see uh, which of those modes do you expect to be more relevant for the figure of merit you are trying to explain. And this is precisely what has been normally done. Eh? People were trying to feed the measure spectra by means of performing saying, well, actually I put all these modes under the same uh, Gaussian and so on. But the lesson we have learned is that that can be dangerous with so many modes and then performing reduced calculations may actually obscure many things. And in particular, neglecting renormalization effects that in many situations indeed are not relevant, but that in interacting systems they are, right? So this is, uh, I think the, 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 anal the complete analysis of WSCP is that indeed chopping off high energy tails can be dangerous. We do obtain different values of the absorption spectra depending on whether we take all or a few, right? And this is a cascade because this affects then what are the, the model parameters in your system Hamiltonian. And for instance, when you try to ascribe saying, okay, this signature in 2D is definitely vibrational coherence. Wrong, it may have an electronic component that you are disregarding. Okay, so thank you very much. If I think there are no other questions here, so we thank you again and thank you very much for.